I share with you guys that um, that often what God does during the week is that God gives me illustrations to share with you all, because you know I do sermon illustrations on the weekend, right? I got a I got another good one today, but I had some good ones last week too, didn't I? Amen. Praise the Lord, right? And so <laughs> uh, we've been going through the book of Philippians, and my goal was that Philippians goes through us. My goal was that we become more like Christ, and by and, and by and by studying God's word, we become conformed to Christ's image. Amen. And so my goal is not just for us to come to church. Our goal is to learn God's word, learn how it applies to our lives, and how we can live a better life for his glory and for his honor. The book of Philippians chapter 1 talks about a single mind. Chapter 2 talks about a submitted mind. Chapter 3 talks about a spiritual mind. And chapter 4 talks about a secure mind. I want you all to learn the whole book of Philippians. Amen. Um, in chapter 1, the primary key term is the gospel. So when you see the word gospel, um, I think it's used five different times in chapter 1. You see the emphasis of what Paul is trying to say. If this book was a memo that you were receiving at work, it would say, it would say to the church at Pil um, Philippi. It would say from Paul, a prisoner in Rome. It would say regarding the welfare of the people in Philippi. And then it would be cc'd to the recipients and readers of the book of Philippians. In other words, Paul's talking to us. Y'all good? All right. Y'all going to make this hard, aren't y'all? All right. All right. Uh, smile at me. So watch this now. So you come here in chapters um, 1, verses um, chapter 1 through 11, he talks about the um, partnership or fellowship in the gospel. Um, chapter 12, I mean, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 through 26, he talks about the fervence of the gospel. In chapter 1, verse 27 through 30, he talks about the faith of the gospel or the fight for the gospel. In chapter 2, verses um, 1 through 4, he kind of talks about consolation. He talks about comfort. In chapter 5 through um, verse 11, he gives the quintessential example of what it means to be humble. In chapter 2, what Paul really argues for is unity through humility. God wants to see us be unified in the body of Christ. Amen? And so if there's anybody who ought to be boastful, arrogant, or prideful, it's Jesus Christ. Um, after, being, um, um, after living with God, he came down to earth, and he ended up being crucified as the Son of God. Amen? But then the Bible says that um, he humbled himself even to the point of death. Verse 9 of chapter 2, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the Father. Amen? And so he comes and says, you know what? When you take the um, low road, God will take you high. But in our society, it says you want to be high, you got to go high. God's got an entirely different system. So we came to chapter 2. We came, um, and we picked up around verse, um, around verse 6, I believe. I'm not sorry, verse 12. We talked about Paul's example and um, Paul being an example of humility and we shared some principles from there about what we ought to do because of what God has done for us. In verse, um, in verse 12, it says, Therefore, beloved, beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So he said, now watch that. He didn't say work on. He said work out. And so he wants us to work out what God has worked in. In other words, he wants us to live out the reality of being a Christian. In verse 13, he says, why? He gives an explanation, for God is at work both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. In other words, God is at work on the inside of our lives, and so because God is at work on the inside, there ought to be some manifestation on the outside. In verse 14, y'all had homework last week, verse 14, he said, do all things without grumbling or questioning. Now, how many of you all did your homework? Raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand. How many of you all, how many of y'all even remembered what I preached last week? All right. <laughs> he says, do all things without grumbling or complaining. And we share with you guys that the imagery of doing everything without grumbling or complaining, what he wants us to do, this whole idea is the idea of grumbling. 
So my wife and I, one of my, um, we had two kids yesterday. We had four basketball games yesterday. It was kind of a light day. We had four basketball games yesterday. They both were near Denton, but they were 30 minutes apart in the um, Denton area. And so one of our sons had to ride with us to drop his sister off. And then we took him in between her 8 and 10 o'clock game over to his game, came back to her game, and then went back to his game at 11.15, then went back to her game at 2 o'clock. But, but as, as well, he got out the car, his teammates weren't there yet. So he got out the car. He really didn't say anything to us, but he kind of, I said, was he grumbling? And she said, yes, sir. He was grumbling, all right? He, he should have heard my sermon last week, right? He should have been grumbling like that, right? So the first thing, God said, you know what? I don't want you all murmuring under your breath because you're not satisfied with what God is doing in your life. But then the second term, um, he used the term, he says, in the ESV, it says questioning. I think in the King James it says um, 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 grumbling or complaining. But what the idea of that second word where it says questioning is the whole idea of not having sharp words. In other words, as a believer in Christ, you should not, you should not be trying to bust people's bubbles with your words. You should not be sharp with your mates. You should not be sharp with your kids. You shouldn't be sharp with your co You shouldn't be sharp with the opposing party. You should not have all these opposing views with one another. Amen? He comes on down here and he says this. He says, I want to see you guys shine as lights. He says, there are three things that should characterize Christians. Number one, you ought to be blameless. Number two, you ought to be innocent. Number three, you ought to be without a blemish. In other words, God says on the inside, God is primarily concerned about our character. And so we focus so much on our behavior. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason. But God wants us to do the right thing for the right reason. God wants our character to be right. Amen? But then watch this now. After your character is right, he also wants to see your conduct be consistent with your character. So God is not just interested in us doing the right things to show off in front of other people, but our heart's in the wrong place. He says, um, um, he, he talked about um, how um, sometimes people can do the right thing, but their hearts are far from him. So where are our hearts at? He comes on down here and he says here in verse 15 that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish, watch this now, in the midst of a, of a crooked and twisted generation. So we say, well, you live in a society, you live in a culture. I want you all to understand, boy, our culture, our society, our world is, is broken. Amen? And so he used this word called crooked, and what he wants to say is, guys, we live in a world that is warped. See, boy, from a distance, this piece of wood looks good. But when you look at it head on, you can see that, boy, it's, it's, it's heavy and it's warped, right? Smile at me. All right, so, boy, it's warped, it's crooked, it's not good for building things. That's how our world is. Our world is spiritually bankrupt. Our world is morally bent. Our world is morally and spiritually broken. Well, boy, Pastor, what's the big issue? The big issue is that, boy, that's the primary place where we function but not only is the world morally broken, not only is the world morally bent, not only is the world spiritually bankrupt, but boy, the challenge is that that same old world, um, 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 the next term you see, it says, it says crooked and perverse generation. Where it says perverse, that word perverse means our world is broken, our world is corrupt, our world is jacked up, but watch this now, our world is also in a place where it tries to pervert and make crooked and make morally bankrupt the people who are in the world as well. So, boy, it's one thing to be messed up. I know you messed up, but keep it to yourself. It's another thing to be morally bankrupt, spiritually, spiritually broken and bent, and now you're trying to make sure other people are morally bankrupt and morally bent. So we live in a world and a society where people say, well, they argue for tolerance, but they're tolerant of everything except Christianity. And so we can talk about Buddhism, we can talk about Islam, we can talk about Shintoism, we can talk about everything else, but don't talk about Christianity, because we talk about Christianity would not equal opportunity and plurals when it comes to Christianity. Are we tracking together? So our society and our world is not just messed up, it's trying to mess up your thinking, your functioning, and how you live. Y'all still good? He goes on here in his passage, and he says, watch this now. He says that, well, you live in a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. God wants you to be a person that is righteous, that is holy, that is pure in everything you do. Amen? 
He says, here, watch this now, holding fast to the word of life, so in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Now, how many of you all find yourself going flat like this balloon sometimes? How many of y'all have to go into work, you go flat? I take care of them kids, you go flat. I deal with the corruption and deception, you go flat. After dealing with mean people, you go flat. What Paul says here is that, boy, you got to hold fast to the word of life. You know what? The word of God, you know what the word of God is? Since, boy, simple, our society is bent, broken, twisted, and warped, God gives us a leveler so we know what is straight, we know what is correct, we know what is right, we know what is level, we know what is straight, and well, 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 Pastor, what in the world is that? Then God gives us his word and his spirit so we know how to level out and know what's level and what's unlevel. Are we tracking together? But well, we live in a world, in the midst of a corrupt world, when you're trying to live for Christ in a hostile world, you go flat sometimes. When you're trying to live for Christ with a, with a world that does not accept your values and the way you live, you go flat sometimes. But he didn't just say the word. He said the word of life. So but when God says word of life, what does word of life mean? Watch this now. The word of life is what we call a genitive, and it tells you how that genitive functions in light of the word. So, boy, the way you keep from going flat in the midst of sharing the gospel, where you keep from going flat in a hostile world of Christianity, you stay connected to God's word, and God's word fills you back up after society has deflated you. And so the reason you stay flat is because you're not staying connected to God's word. But when you stay connected to God's word, God will inflate you even though you have been deflated and God can fill you up with as much as you need as long as you need it because you stay connected to him. Now I know y'all wonder, when that thing gonna blow? But as God fills you, God expands your capacity. So the longer you spend in God's word, the more God stretches you. But when God stretches you, God also expands your capacity. Are we tracking together? So when you stay in God's word, what God does is God blows you up. God makes you bigger in the midst of a world that keeps trying to deflate you. You say, well, Pastor, life is hostile and life is um, rough and, and life is challenging. And Pastor, you don't know my maid. And Pastor, you don't know my kids. And you know my boss. Guys, you know what? I know exactly what you're going through. I want you, when, when boy, things get enough, um, I'm rough, I want you to tie a knot on it and just hang on. Just hang on. Just hang on. It's too many of us who are letting go when things get tough. Sometimes God says, just hang on. Are we tracking together? And so that was last week's lesson. Smile at me, all right. <laughs> God was like, when you stay connected, he will fill you. So I was sharing with you all that, boy, God always gives me this illustration. I was kind of getting ahead of myself. And so this week, boy, it was a, a busy week as usual. And, um, 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 you know, one of my sons had, you know, they got these things now. They had these basketball tournaments. And but, uh, they, bec they become so rude that, well, they have basketball. They let kids out of school to go play basketball. I said, these kids can't even play. I mean, boy, I mean, what, what do you mean? I said, well, my child, boy, two weeks ago, Thursday and Friday, no school, can't play, going to play basketball. And, but my kids, well, my kids go to school, but they charge you, though, this is like a fee to go to school there. I'm like, I ain't paying y'all to be dismissed early to go play no, anyway, all right, that's my issue, right? So anyway, we had another one of the things this weekend, Friday and Saturday, no, 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 back up. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, they had basketball games, all righty? And so my wife, boy, she had the, um, she had the um, alabaster box on Friday. Did y'all come to alabaster box? So, but they had, um, uh, they had, they had alabaster box on Friday, and so that left me and the kids. <laughs> That's about it, right? I'm talking about she got her hair done first, right? All that kind of stuff, right? So anyway, boy, um, and so, but my son, on Thursday, he had a game at um, he had a game at 12 p.m. and then he had a game at 8 p.m. I'm like, why don't y'all be considerate of parents and keep them games a little closer? Way way out in Denton and stuff, right? So Friday had some more games on Friday, right? 
So I go, I go on Friday, and um, and but they had well, I'm getting, well, that, well, was that anyway, one day we had games spread out all that. So anyway, I kept the three kids with me. I said, you know what, guys, we're gonna go to the game, and but I got, you know, I don't wanna drive back home, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna take y'all to the movies. And so I, I did a theater that was close to the um, basketball game, but we went there, and you know, Frozen 2 was out, right? So, well, we went and saw Frozen 2, and the kids are having a bus. I said, I should have brought a book. And I was next to a light. I said, I should have brought a book. So anyway, I'm sitting there, and boy, everybody watching the movie, and I'm on my phone doing stuff. And then uh, my daughter gets up and say, um, Daddy, got to go to the bathroom. That created a dilemma. All right, already I'm spending all this money, right? So, boy, I get there. Don't put it up yet. So, boy, I get there to the movie. But first, you got to spend all your money. Did y'all know they serve alcohol at the movies now? How did y'all know that? All right, I mean, I, I go there, but they got Crown Royal, Cavassier, uh, 155. I'm like, what the world? I thought it was the movies, right? And so, I mean, I mean, I, I didn't know that, right? So uh, I actually took a picture of it because I, I, I just didn't know. I mean, I'm, I'm watching too much Netflix or something, right? Or, or Redbox, right? So anyway, but we go in there, but you spend all your money, and then, boy, you go spend the rest of it on popcorn and hot dogs. Whatever. So she said, Dad, Dad, I go to the bathroom. So I created a problem. It was just me, her, and her two brothers. I said, well, I said, well come on, baby. So we go in there, but we walk or whatever. And so, boy, uh, we get there. So I got a dilemma. Ain't no family restaurants. So well, I'm, a, I'm a man. So I walked up into the man's bathroom, and this is what happened. <laughs> <laughs>
it wasn't even real, right? But I got that picture out of my senior picture book. So watch this now. I was so satisfied with something that was fake. Not that I perfect like, perfect like it was real. I preserved the memory of one of my most inauthentic moments. And I wonder how many of us as Christians, we perpetrate, celebrate, and commemorate things that are inauthentic. We tracking together? Now y'all know I didn't bring you here talking about my daughter and me, don't y'all? Don't y'all dare put that picture on Facebook. Take that picture down real fast already. <laughs> I was in the cyber bully police to your house so fast, you hear me? Watch this now. I want to share something with you all day that's countercultural, that's counter-emotional, and that's counter-philosophical. It's countercultural because, boy, our, our culture, our culture, our culture bask in things that are inauthentic. Our culture celebrates and venerates and preserves and commemorates things that are inauthentic. Our society, boy, is kind of emotional because you know what? We're so, we're so busy and, boy, we're just so happy with the feeling that we don't even care what produces the feeling. It's kind of philosophical because, because, because God is about truth and not things that are false. So, Pastor, what is this, what is this thing? Um, in Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to finish up chapter 2 before Christ comes back today. In verses 19 through 30, he talks about two other examples of unity through humility. He talks about two people, but boy, what, what stood out to me about these two examples, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Anybody here name their child Epaphroditus? I'm, I'm just checking, right? And so watch this now. He chooses two people who are models and examples of servants of Jesus Christ to walk with God, who live for God, who love God. But what stood out to me was not per se just Timothy and Epaphroditus. What stood out to me was the relationship that, 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 that the church at Philippi and Paul share with one another. And what stood out was, you know what, this is totally contrary to the relationships that we experience and we encounter in the American church. Now, when you look at this, you would think that, boy, what's, what's described in the Bible surely can't be for our times. But what he gives us in the Bible, he gives us an example of what authentic Christianity ought to look like. There's a saying that says this. It says, a sane man seems insane in an insane society. A sane man seems insane in an insane society. Let me uh, adapt that. An authentic Christian seems inauthentic in an inauthentic society. An authentic Christian seems inauthentic in the midst of an inauthentic society. And so what happens is, guys, we live in a day and age where, guys, we have... We have, we, have, we have made the church to be politically correct and not spiritually correct. Now, boy, I'm not talking about Democrats, Republicans, Independents. I'm making reference, you know what? We say what we need to say to get ahead and to get what we want from people. And so what happens is, boy, we don't, we don't, really, we don't really love one another. We just, we, we, we put up with one another. We patronize one another. We don't tell one another the truth because we don't want to damage the relationship. And so what happens is we don't live authentic lives. We tell people what they want to hear or we avoid them because we don't want to be real Christians. Are we tracking together? Let's watch this now. So, boy, what happens is this, that, boy, we come and watch. Well, boy, how are you doing? Well, I'm doing, I'm doing fine. I'm blessed and highly favored. You know what? You're always blessed and highly favored, huh? The reality is we're not always blessed and highly favored. Sometimes we are struggling. Sometimes we are hurt. Sometimes we are ticked off. Sometimes we're just downright mad. Sometimes we don't have strong faith in God. Sometimes we want to just throw in the towel, right? But the problem is since we are inauthentic people in general, when people are struggling, they never want to admit it because everybody else is faking it. So they feel compelled 
to go along with the charade. Everybody else who's Christian just fine, so I must be just fine because I don't want people to think I'm defective. So what we do is we hide behind this false veil of wholeness and we don't acknowledge brokenness. And the reality is all of us are broken somewhere. And then we, and then boy, we, we live life contrary to God's word. The Bible says all have sinned, past tense, and come short, present tense, of the glory of God. The Bible clearly teaches that we will not be totally perfect until Christ comes back and gives us a new body, but we pretend like we're perfect down here, and then people who are not Christians say, well, I can see your imperfections. I don't want to be a part of that thing called Christianity because you guys are inauthentic frauds. So the whole mindset has crept us with the church. And so what's happened is in the church we have become transactional rather than transformational. Y'all good? I'm trying to show y'all, one, how we wouldn't want to be here at Destiny Church. Number two, I want to I wanna help you guys see how you ought to live and what God intends for you to have as a believer in Christ. God doesn't want you like my daughter looking back and saying, what in the world is that? We want you to become extremely familiar with authentic Christianity. Are we tracking together? So watch now. We become transactional rather than transformational. Pastor, what do you mean by that? You know what? In the church today, it's, it's come down to, well, but you know what? What can y'all do for me? And boy, when, when y'all can do for me, we good. And boy, when you can stop doing for me, then there's a problem. I'm going to go someplace else. We have become consumers with the absence of making a contribution. Are we tracking together? We come together, and boy, it's, it's all about the size of the church. It's all about the influence of the church. It's all about the personality that's speaking rather than how well do we love one another, how well do we stimulate one another towards love and good deeds, how often do we pray for one another, how often do we sacrifice for one another, do we fellowship for one another, and what do we give to one another? And so, and so, and so, and so what struck me here in Philippians chapter 2 as Paul talked about these guys, he talked about a, uh, a rare form of Christianity called authentic Christianity. And he picks up here in verse, in verse 19. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so I too may be cheered by news of you. And so Paul identifies himself, he identifies Timothy, he identifies Epaphroditus, and he says, you know what, boy, these are people whom I think would be worthy to come and serve you. He said, number one, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so I too may be cheered by news of you. So in other words, Timothy will be cheered to hear about the welfare of the people at Philippi. In verse 25, he said, I thought it necessary to send to you a pamphlet that is my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Watch this now. I know in Christianity, you know what? Well, boy, everybody's called to minister. Yeah, everybody's called to minister, but everybody hadn't been set aside for vocational ministry. We tracking together? And so, boy, there is a distinction between those who are Christians who are following Christ and ministering to those who've been set aside for a lifetime of ministry. What Paul points out here, number one, is that, is that, is that boy, Paul talks about a genuine calling. Have you been called to serve the people of God, to help move them from immaturity to maturity, to help them worship God, serve God, live for God, honor God, and look just like Jesus Christ? So the reality is, is, is that, guys, every place you find a spiritual gift in, in the Bible, you'll also see that God gives other believers the same responsibility. But those who have the spiritual gift carry on a greater responsibility and accountability to carry it out. So number, so number one, what you see is you see, you see some people here who have a genuine call. Number two, you see they have a genuine concern. Say concern. He says here in verse 20, he says, For, that word for is giving you further explanation. For I have no one like him. Watch this now. 
who, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Now watch this now. When people talk about churches today at large, they talk about the music, preacher, the facilities, or do they talk about how much the people at that church love them and care for them? He said, so you know what? I don't know of anybody else who's going to be as concerned about you as Timothy. It's, 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 boy, it's, boy, it's boy, interesting. Watch what he says. Watch this now. It's a crazy dynamic. He says here in verse, in, verse, in verse 20, For I have no one like him who would be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But where is Paul? Paul's at Rome. Paul says, you know what? I don't have anybody else here at Rome. I can send it to um, Philippi to love on you guys, to care for you guys, to check out your welfare. You want to know why? Because most of the people are concerned about their own interest. You know what? We live in a day and a time where most people are concerned about their own interest. And so when you genuinely care about the interests of other people in the context of a society that does not care about the interests of other people, it seems like that, uh, that, boy, you don't really care about the interests of other people. What happens? Watch this now. When you call and check with somebody consistently, like, what, what, I owe you some money? Why do you keep calling me? Is there a problem? Is something wrong? So the other day, I was, um, I was, um, I was um, going through my phone. I was trying to find some pictures. I went to another son's basketball game on Monday, right? And so I saw one of the, um, I saw the parents of one of the kids who I coached on my son's team. And we, yeah, but we won the championship. We did. We did. I ain't bragging. I'm just, just testifying, right? And so, well, they were just so excited to see me. Hey, Pastor Will, man. Get by their son. I said, that's what I got big, Eddie. That's why I'm, I'm going through pictures trying to find pictures back when they played or whatever. Then I ran across one of our old members. And I saw a picture. It's where I had married her and her husband. And so, you know, this will this a, this a encourage her. And it, it'll get her husband some points. Smile at me. You gotta have a brother out, right? So, so boy, I text the picture over to her. Ah, oh, this is just so great! All that kind of stuff, right? Anything to make y'all happy, right? So, watch it now. So, so boy, um, so but she asked about my family. So, boy, I sent her a picture. Oh, everybody's gotten so big, this, that, and the other, and so on and so forth, or whatever. And so, and so I sent her that picture, and she said, "Yeah, my son is up at such and such school." So, so I said, "You know what? Me and Miss Womack lived there for eight years." But she's really concerned about her son. So you know what? Um, these are my two best friends in the whole wide world. Here are their phone numbers. I'm going I'm to tell them you're going to call. And I say, whatever need your son has, they'll take care of him. I say, well, go over to this church. This church well, they'll take care of him. So I said, and I said, oh, yeah. By the way, we still got, we have a church member at our church right now who's got a child who goes to the same school your child goes to. So here's their phone number. And then I let them know, boy, you're going to be calling them to, to boy, um, hear about the school, all that kind of stuff. See, I thought I was just sending her a picture of her and her husband. But, boy, she was so elated. And, boy, I thought, boy, there was a ministry need there, but she needed to be connected with her son. And so at the end of my note, I said, you know what? I don't care what church you go to. I'm always your pastor. We're tracking together. See, guys, in the body of Christ, we cannot just be concerned about our own interest. What builds us? So I was talking to my son on Monday, and but we were going through this discipleship thing, and I was sharing with my son. I said, James, let me share with you, James, some of the things that I do. God, I said, James, I, 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 know, I know you don't see um, all that I do. I said, James, one thing I try to do, I try doing for people what nobody else would do for them. We're tracking together. So I mean, it's not just about trying to grow a large church. It's not just about trying to get people to come. See, when I was in college in a fraternity, I was trying to get people to come to my party so I collect that money, but we could build our treasury, right? That wasn't about trying to serve people. That was about self-interest. But guys, as a pastor, it's not about me. It's about trying to build people. Let me ask you a question. Are you trying to build people? Is this church and your relationship characterized by you being interested in the interest of others? Or is it just your own personal interest? Earlier, earlier in chapter 2, he says, you know what, don't look out for the interest of yourself only, but also the interest of others. Paul goes on here in verse 21, he says, they, they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And why we can't get ahead politically in our society? Because of this thing called self-interest. 
This thing called self-interest, because you know what? Because, boy, we can never move all the people when you've got some of the people only interested in what pertains to them. And so there's a guy by the name of um, Reinhold Niebuhr. Reinhold Niebuhr writes in a book called Love and Justice. In his book, Love and Justice, he says that, he says that, boy, we can never pursue authentic love because authentic love is, is absent of self-interest. And so whenever you begin to act in self-interest, you therefore just dismiss love. Now, I don't believe with him always because, boy, I don't think we get to a point where we can totally do things totally free of self-interest. But I think his main point is true, is that, boy, we always have self-interest. Can you function without something personally benefiting you? That's biblical Christianity. Doing things with, boy, nobody's going to give you anything in return. We have, a, we have a, stated, um, 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 a, a statement and, a, and boy, our distinctive. He said, well, we will be so generous that, that, that boy, it makes people nervous. Because when you're generous, people think you got something up your sleeve. Why are you doing that? We're tracking together. It was kind of funny. I, um, I, I, had a, I had a lunch appointment at, um, at La Madeline's um, on Wednesday. And so I was coming out, and, boy, I saw these two ladies trying to get this guy who was um, evidently um, um, handicapped, trying to get him in the car. It's a big old guy, you know, so I'm, I'm walking through, and a uh, you know, big old black guy, and, and you know, people say, I say, y'all need some help? They say, no, we good, we good, we good. All right. <laughs> and I got in the car and kind of chuckled, right, because you know what? I know what the problem is. They, they think he's going to try robbing me or something, you know, but he don't know us, so why in the world would he try to help us he don't even know us? And the reason I'm trying to help you is because I got the Holy Spirit of God. And I see you guys need help. So I'm just coming to try to help you, even though I don't know you. Anybody trying to rob you? <laughs> number one, we're going to have a genuine, a genuine call. Number two, genuine concern. Number, number three is genuine cooperation. Paul says here in verse 22, but you know Timothy's proven worth. I'm going to share with our ministers. Guys, you know what, guys? Ministers often come, but they want privilege, and they want clout before they shed some blood. Are you proven, or are you unproven? Uh, can I brag on my son real quick? It's not, I, I, oh, I guess not. Thank you, ma'am. I, I listen to her. All righty. And so, boy, I, I got a son, and boy, um, he's on 10th grade, and so, um, 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 he's playing JV basketball. And so um, he's playing JV basketball. And um, two weeks ago, he scored 25 points in one game. Praise the Lord, right? So he scores, but he loves to shoot. And so, but he scored. He looked out for his own self-interest. All right. All right. <laughs> and so this week, he had to bring some kids up off the JV because some other kids got hurt on varsity. So, boy, he got into the game, and, boy, the boy acted like a woman. I mean, he was just showing out, right? And so, boy, he hit a couple three-pointers. He was knocking them down, all that kind of stuff. And I say, son, you know why I'm proud of you this week, son? See, I, see, son, I already knew you could shoot. I ain't proud of that. But what I'm proud of, son, is that, son, when they elevated you, you proved your worth. How many of y'all proved your worth? See, we often want somebody to give us, give us accolades before we prove we worthy of the accolades. Paul says, hey, you know what? You know what? Um, 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 this guy, verse 22, he says in verse 22, um, but you know Timothy's proven worth how as a son with a, with a father has served me in the gospel. Watch this now. It's, it's not just serving him. It's serving him in the gospel. They had genuine cooperation around advancing the gospel. Number four, he makes reference to genuine credibility. Look at verse 22 again. He says here, but, but you know Timothy's proven work. How as a son um, was with the father, he served me in the gospel. That word prove, that comes from the Greek term dokimo, um, 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 dokimazo. It means to prove something. He says, I hope, therefore, to send him just as, as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that surely I myself will come also. Paul is so concerned about the church at Philippi, he wants to send somebody who's qualified to help take care of them. So you know what? You know what? And well, when things get right, I'm going to come myself. He goes on here in verse 26. He says, for he has been longing. I'm sorry, verse 25. I thought it necessary to send to you a paraphrase my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all. You know, guys, at an authentic church, the people long for the people they serve. It's not just about being served. It's about serving. They have a heart for the people they serve. 
No, guys, it's not just about the sound, the lights, the building. Well, all that stuff is appropriate, but watch this now. It's more about do they really care about me, my welfare, my spirituality, my development, my status in God, my confidence in God, my walk with God. So it's not about becoming a millionaire. And lastly, they have a genuine consideration for them. Look at verse 27, 28, 29. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you all heard that he was ill. Watch this now. He cared so much about the church of Philippi, he didn't even want them to know that he was sick. It goes on and says this. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, not only on him, but um, on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore you may rejoice at seeing him again. Let me ask you a question. Have you proven yourself to be so faithful, proven yourself to be so loving, proven yourself to be so caring, that when you walk in the room, people are refreshed? My best friend, uh, one, of, one, one of the statements he, t he told me, his grandpa told me, he says, he says, they may not know who you are before you get there or when you get there, but make sure they know who you are when you leave. Are people refreshed when they see you? Are people encouraged when you come into the room? Are people encouraged when you call their phone number? See, guys, that's the kind of excitement you ought to have in the context of authentic Christian relationships. He goes on and says, I'm going to let y'all go. He says, so, so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor, and will honor such men. What kind of such men? Men who long for your spiritual growth. Men who, 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 whom, whom, whom have your interest at heart. People who really want to see you grow. See, guys, a, a lot of times, people, people are interested in you as long as you can do something for them. Here's a test. How do they treat people who can't do anything for them? He goes on and says this, verse 30. For he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. God says, you know what, I want to see you. I want to see you have a high consideration for those in the gospel. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, he said, um, those who work hard at teaching and preaching, you ought to, you ought to um, 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 give double honor. We live in an era now, and boy, preachers are part of the problem in general. We live in an era now where people have no regard or low regard for those who shepherd their souls in Christ. Hebrews says to give honor to those who, who shepherd you in Christ. First Timothy says give them double honor. First Corinthians chapter 16 verse 18 makes reference to um, esteeming them and honoring them who watch over you in the gospel. Amen? One time um, 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 a guy told me, he said, he said, you just the pastor. And what I had come to see him. I had come to help keep his marriage together. I came to have help care for his family. And boy, he deflated me. He said, you just the pastor. I said, that's all right. God sent me. God knows me. God keeps filling me. And one day you're going to change that tune after you benefit from what I bring to your life. Amen? So chapter 2 is about unity. I thought about Isaiah 6. I'm going to close with this. Isaiah 6. Y'all know Isaiah 6. In the year King Uzziah died. And I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. Y'all should be able to finish this thing for me. And his train filled the temple. If I was old school Baptist, I'd be humming by now. And his train filled the temple. <laughs> um, and um. And it's rough temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. Two covered his face. Two covered his feet. Two he flew. And one called one another and said, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to him, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This was an example of somebody who was impure. They needed somebody else, an external agent, to come and cleanse them. And boy, gave the image of the um, seraphim taking the tongues with the hot coals. The fire is a purification element. It now purified his lips because his lips were filthy. And now he's, his sin has been atoned for.
because he'd been cleansed. New Testament terminology, we know we are sinners. We have a Savior who was pure, who died for us. When you place your faith in him, your sins are now atoned for. But then the question becomes, and then what? He says here in verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? There's our word again. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Over here in chapter 2, he uses this word sin three times. Verse 19, Hope in the Lord to send Timothy to you. Verse 25, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. In verse 28, I am the more eager to send him therefore. Let me ask you a question. How often do you put together a text message or an email? And instead of hitting the button, send, say, you know what? This message is not quite ready to send yet. Anybody ever get upset and want to blow a text at somebody? Or hear somebody with a tweet and respond to protect yourself, redeem yourself? Say, you know what? I better not send this yet. Because this is not ready yet. God says, you're that message. You're that messenger. And God wants to know, are you ready to send yet? He said, you know what, I've got somebody, there's nobody like Timothy. Um, I, I want to send Epaphroditus. He's ready to be sent to come care for you. If God has a spiritual need, can he send you? Are you ready to be sent? Are you ready to be used? God wants to see us send ready. We're going to Ecuador. We're going over to Lancaster. We start some churches in different parts of the country. Are you send ready? Not S-I-N. S-E-N-D. 